Father, thank you that your word endures forever. And we pray that we might in these moments be swept up into the drama and the glory of what you have purpose to do for your world, through your son, and even in our lives. Speak to us, we pray, by your spirit, for the glory of Jesus. Amen. I've called this morning as we look at this section of 1 Peter, stranger living. Not that our living should be overly strange, but Peter is calling us to live as strangers in the world. Now, we've come across that a few weeks back, right in the very opening of his letter. So in verse one, he says that we're God's elect. God has chosen us out of his astonishing mercy and grace. And we're chosen to be strangers in the world, meaning that this world is not our ultimate home. Its values are not ultimately our values. Its comforts can't actually comfort us. We're heading to an entirely different destination of heaven. And so we're to live with entirely different values as those of us who know we've been saved by Jesus and are journeying on to heaven. That is our destiny. And if that's your destiny, Peter says you're going to live very differently from those around you who don't share your Christian faith. I want to look at these verses with you in two sections. The first half really sort of just going over as we trace Peter all the reasons we have to live as strangers and then really hearing this really strong call to live lives of love which is the ultimate expression that we're strangers on earth on our way joyfully to heaven. So here's the first point. So we look at verses 17 to 21 of chapter one. Peter reminds us that we are called to trust in a righteous, loving father. Can I ask, is that the God you're secure in this morning, you're trusting in? A God who's a righteous and a loving father who calls you to trust in him. That's what Peter says. When I start preparing my sermons each week, normally early in the week, I love to read the passage just out loud, usually several times. So it really begins to register with me. And I started reading from verse 17 on about Tuesday morning, I think it was. And I stopped just a few words in. As I read, since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially. And I stopped. I thought that is our God. He he's a father. He's loving. He's tender. He's patient. He's merciful like any good father, though he's perfect. But he's no pushover. He doesn't brush under the carpet our sins. He's a judge. He's a perfect, impartial, fair judge. Not a distant or a cruel judge because he's a father. He's not one God or the other God. He is the living God who is father and judge, righteous and loving. And I think if we begin to grasp those things, they will really shape the way we live as strangers on earth. So let's reflect a little bit more on verse 17. If God is our father, then we are strangers on earth, knowing that we are traveling to our father's house in heaven. Do you see how calling on God as your father means you know you're going to meet him one day? I wonder if that thought has really registered with you yet. He's your father who's prepared a place for you. You will meet him. You will live with him. So this world really isn't your home or mine. We get discouraged, don't we? We get cynical in life. We get hurt. We withdraw into ourselves. We don't live the Christian life with zeal and confidence. That's normally not because we're lacking the knowledge. It's because we're lacking the conviction, the excitement. But if 
we reflect steadily on the truth that in the gospel, Jesus' father is our father. Loving, gentle, tender, comforting. Who wants us to call on him? Who wants us to believe his promises? Surely we will start being more excited about being with him one day in heaven and living for him on our days on earth. So our father is waiting to hear us and willing us on. And one day we'll be with him in heaven. But the father we call upon is also the righteous judge. The same verse says that he judges each man's work impartially. So he, he's without favoritism. And because of that, we are to have reverent fear. That doesn't mean we are insecure about our salvation, but it means that we pay close attention to honouring him and to serving him in everything. The judge, if you're a Christian, is a judge who longs to reward your faith, even though it's a faith he's given you and a faith his Holy Spirit strengthens every single moment. But as you respond to God through faith, he will one day reward you. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Don't think that your sufferings and your perseverance are forgotten. They will one day be richly rewarded. So go on serving him in all of the details of your life. That is what Peter is saying to us. I'm sure some of us on this morning have seen the video on YouTube of Russell Brand. Russell Brand put this video up and basically is saying everybody's Googling prayer in this lockdown situation we find ourselves in. Everybody's asking very privately, of course, what's prayer all about? As people feel desperate and anxious, he said his words, this lockdown has forced us into a monastic corner. We can't go the places, see the people we want to. We're in a, in his words, in a monastic corner. He said, we're confronted by a different kind of reality. And he said, because of that, what we all need is a connection to the sacred. And he talks about prayer as he understands it. And I really welcome what he's saying. I wouldn't quite agree with his understanding of God. I think there's lots of problems in it. It's not the God I recognize in the Bible, but it's the impulse in his heart, which I think is deep down in every human heart. A desire to reach out to a God who cares and to a God who is just and merciful. And the wonderful revelation of Jesus Christ is that our God cares. Our God is merciful and perfect. He knows what he's doing. He's more, got more than enough justice to deal with this wicked world and bring it one day to a final perfect judgment. But he's got more than enough mercy as a compassionate father to deal with foolish and selfish people like, like me, probably like you. Christian friends, let's never forget the wonder as we live our lives on earth, that we have a God who is father and perfect judge, loving and righteous. Let's live passionately for him. And let's remember as we go a little bit in these verses that the father and the judge gives his son for us and sentences him in our place. This is verses 18 through to 21. Now, if you're not a Christian, you're with us this morning and we're thrilled that you are here and we slightly suspected that you might show up. If you're not a Christian this morning, this is the heart of the offer that God is making to you. We've all known people who have been incredibly generous to us with their time, their care, maybe even with their money. And we, we don't forget them quickly, do we? Or we shouldn't. Peter's saying to forgetful Christians, remember how generous 
God has been to you. He says you weren't rescued with just money, with silver or gold, but you were rescued with a life. The image Peter takes up here is of Jesus being like the Passover lamb back in Egypt. The Israelites had to slaughter a lamb, daub their doorposts with its blood as a sign that they were trusting only in God's mercy as they sacrificed that lamb. Well, Jesus said that he was that lamb. He was the ultimate fulfillment, the reality of that sign. And Peter says, yes, he was that lamb. The only one who sacrificed himself to pay for our sin, to pay for your sin. He didn't give money. He didn't give his time, his emotional energy, whatever else you value as precious. He gave something far more. His own life. He was chosen, says Peter, before the creation of the world, set apart. But revealed as the father's sacrifice for our sins. So if you're not a Christian this morning, what I really want you to hear is that you can be forgiven all of your sins today. All those awful memories that haunt you, guilt which often paralyzes you, makes you so miserable about the past or scared about the future. Jesus Christ, when you come to him in faith alone, will wash away all of your sins because he's paid for you. You have to trust him. You have to accept that incredible offer of life and put all of your trust in him. And then God is not some distant, far away, mildly intriguing, but ultimately confusing idea. God becomes the judge who gave his son for you. And the father who welcomes you with no ifs or buts, no distance or barrier, but brings you to himself. Now, for those of us who are listening, this will be most of us who are Christians. Allow yourself to be reminded of that, please. Allow that truth to sink in how deeply you are loved. All that the Father and the Son have worked for your salvation. And then understand this promise as, as the way Peter's using it. A promise for you so that you can live life here as a stranger, passing through, confident of heaven, and wanting to invest all of your time, money, gifts, energy, to serving so fabulous a master. Not because you have to, but because it is the deepest privilege and joy to live for so wonderful a God. So that's our first point. There's only two this morning. We're called to trust in a righteous and a loving father. Let's do that. And let's live for him. Secondly, we're born again to enjoy and to share the deep love of God in Christ. We're born again to enjoy and to share the deep love of God in Christ. Now, Peter really here is saying what it means for us to live as strangers is that we're to live lives of love. Would you see that with me, please, in verse 22? Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart that is the very center of this section we're looking at this morning. that's that's what i really want you to hear if you're a christian love one another deeply from the heart paul sa uh, peter says that we're to hear that command as those who have his phrase in verse 22 is obeyed the truth obeyed the truth and there are lots of people around the world who think that god if there is a god wants them to do something to obey some rule perhaps to give away their money or, or, or fast or pray or feel guilt about their sins or, or go to church 
There were some very religious people who, when Jesus Christ was alive, asked him, you can read it up later on in John chapter six. Well, what must we do to do the work that God requires? They kind of figure God's into rules. He gave lots of rules in their Bible, the Old Testament. So what, what's the big rule, Jesus? What have we got to do? What does he want us to do? Jesus said, well, this is what God wants you to do. To believe in the one he sent. And that's the truth for us. What does God want us to do? To believe in Jesus. Now, Peter's shorthand for that is in verse 22, we've got to obey the truth. To believe that the good news of Jesus is the truth for a needy world and for our broken lives. And when we do that, we discover a miracle has taken place. An absolute miracle. Verse 23, the for, connecting word for, means because. Because you have been born again. The love and the forgiveness and the invading power of Jesus have come into your life in such an astonishing way. It's nothing less than a brand new start in life, than a brand new life. The past forgiven the future one, heaven, absolutely certain for you if you're a Christian. You have been born again. And that, that new birth shows itself in a way that I wonder if you've discovered is true for you. Back in verse 22, Peter says, you have sincere love for your brothers and your sisters. What that means is when you became a Christian, the people that you thought you could just safely ignore or the people you thought you didn't have to love ever, you could always look down on them or avoid them. They are now people you love deeply. God has worked a major miracle in your life. He's given you sincere love for all who trust in Jesus. That's the sign that you've begun again with God, that he's now your father and your saviour. But you've got to keep at it, Peter is saying. If you're going to live counterculturally for God, you must keep on loving one another deeply from the heart. It's got to be sincere, it's got to be real, and it will be costly. But this is a love which God is looking for and which God delights in sincere love for one another in the family of God. I've talked a little bit about the new birth, being born again. And now Peter's gonna talk about the Bible. And as evangelical Christians, we think, yeah, they're, they're, that's the stuff we love to talk about, being born again and the Bible. There are, there are big convictions and yeah, we're right, they are. Please, God, they, they'll never be anything but central core convictions to us as Christians. But see why Peter is using them. Why does he talk about being born again? So that you and I understand how we must love each other deeply. And why does he talk about the Bible? To show us this is the Bible's message and this is the power of the word of God to empower us and to command us to love each other deeply. In other words, he's using teaching about the new birth and the Bible to serve one single point. We've got to love each other. It's not enough to say, well, I've been born again. It's not enough to say, well, I believe the Bible is the word of God. We must love each other. That is a great distinctive of being a pilgrim stranger as a Christian. So Peter says, verse 23, we've been born again through the imperishable seed, the living and enduring word of God. That's a great reality. So we must love from the heart. We must be completely sincere because that's what God's powerful word has achieved in us. It's made us new. It commands us to love 
and it brings the power of God in us so that we can love. Peter quotes here from Isaiah verse 24. It's a, it's a wonderful quote, verse 24 and 5, quoting from Isaiah 40. And what Isaiah is saying there is that you and I naturally live for passing and fading glories. The glory of reputation. The glory of material security, the glory of status. The glory of leisure and comfort. Isaiah says all of those are going to fade. All of our glories, if we're not careful, will wither away like flowers or like grass in late summer. He's saying don't live for those false glories. The word of the Lord stands forever. That means the word that's given you a new birth. And the word which is always commanding and empowering you to live a life of love. Love one another deeply. Why? Because that's what we were born again for. And that's God's abiding command to us. Now, in our remaining time, if we're going to love one another deeply, we need to lose the hatred and we need to long for spiritual nourishment. Firstly, we need to lose the hatred. That's verse one of chapter two. You can't love while you hate. One or the other is controlling your heart, isn't it? We need to get rid. Here's a hall of shame which Peter wants us to walk through. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, the sins of attitude and behavior and word. It's a hall of shame. Maybe it's a hall of shame that we've walked through this week that we've lived in. We can recapture memories of conversations or, or attitudes. We know controlling temperaments. Peter says, get rid. We need to identify those sins, the ways we're offending our loving father and our righteous judge. We need to go back to the cross. We need to see what those sins cost our wonderful savior. We need to see at the cross, as we look at the broken body of Jesus, the attitude of God to our malice and our hypocrisy and our slander. We need to repent deeply and feel the invading power of the forgiveness of God in Christ. And as we stay close to the cross, humbled and thankful for our mercy, we discover the Holy Spirit working new attitudes of mercy and love and patience towards others. So please, can you have the courage to look at your heart? What's lurking there? Will you take it to the cross? Will you lose that hatred? And will you go on in the power of Christ, expressing your reverent fear for God in deep love for those around you? Well, if we're to do that, Day in, day out with hard people in difficult circumstances, we must long for spiritual nourishment. The image from verse two is you and me like babies bawling for the nourishment of the Bible. Because if the Bible isn't nourishing us, our Christian lives and our Christian love will be small and weak. In spiritual terms, we'll give in to selfishness and doubt. We'll be stunted in our growth if we're not seeking out the promises, the teaching, the training, the commands, the warnings, the encouragements of God's word, the Bible. If your Bible is a closed and foreign book to you, you'll live just like anybody else. Your mindset on the fading glories of life. And your heart's not open to other people. 
but stay in God's word. And you'll start to see how he's calling you to love. You will experience his spirit giving you courage to love deeply. Man shall not live by the lockdown alone. I don't know about your heart, the lockdown makes me selfish and gloomy and lazy. I think the lockdown hammers our faith, squashes us into our home, suffocates our good intention, invades our headspace. We need to be people of God's word who are getting God's perspective moment by moment, day by day. Crave that word, get that word into you, enjoy that word, hide that word in your heart. You have tasted, verse three, the Lord is good. Taste again and taste more and more and live a life of love. Enjoy him and share his goodness with others. Amen. Shall we pray? Lord God, thank you for the wonder of the gospel. It's power. It's truth. And we hear the command today to love one another deeply from the heart. Forgive, we pray, Lord, the malice, the envy, the hypocrisy, the slander of our lives. Help us to embrace again so wonderful a saviour, to look confidently to a rewarding judge, to rest secure in the embrace of a loving father, and to use our days wisely as we journey on to heaven and fill our numbered and fleeting days with the love and the good news of the Lord Jesus himself, in whose name we pray. Amen.